Kennedy gets up and he gives this speech and he says, 2,000 years ago, the best thing that you could say about yourself was, qui was Romanus sum, I am a citizen of Rome. But now, the best thing you can say about yourself is, you know, if you, if you say you're a sort of defender of freedom, ich bin ein Berliner. Now, there's a persistent myth that he misspoke, and, and I'll tell you what it is. You've all, I'm sure, heard it or probably heard it. There's a German pastry, which is referred to as a Berliner. It's not, it's not called a Berliner in Berlin, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. It's mostly referred to that in southwest Germany and Swabia. Kennedy had very good advisors around him, speakers of German. And he also showed the text of the speech to Willy Brandt, the mayor of West Berlin, subsequently the, the, prime, the chancellor of Germany who's standing right there. To get, and Brandt like, wrote out phonetic spelling of it so he would say it correctly. In German, it's common if you're saying I am something like I'm a doctor or I'm a librarian, you don't put the indefinite article in, you don't put the ein. So you don't, you don't say ich bin ein Arzt, you say ich bin Arzt, I'm a doctor, ich bin Bibliothekar, I'm a librarian. And a lot of people have looked at this and said subsequently, now the story was the Berliners heard this, thought he said, I'm a donut, <laughs> and, and laughed. But this, this, is in fact, this is in fact not the case. Um, because, and, and I've, been, I've, I've been, I'm not a native speaker by any means, but I've been assured that, that this is correct by a large number of native speakers, that if you say, ich bin Berliner, what you're saying is, I was born in Berlin. I'm a I'm Berliner born and bred. If you say, ich bin ein Berliner, what you're saying is, spiritually, I'm a Berliner. And that's really what he meant to say. He wasn't saying that he'd been born in Berlin. What he was saying was that, spiritually, if you are a defender of freedom, if, if you're someone who wants to oppose the, the threat of communism, the best thing you can say about yourself is, spiritually, I'm a Berliner. And also, if you listen to the recording, like the, they're not laughing after this. They're, they're applauding and, and, and shouting because they understood exactly what he meant. They understood that he had come to Berlin to say, this is a difficult time for all of you, but the, the thing to remember is that you're right on the front lines of this, like, of the struggle for freedom that's basically the, 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 dominant, the dominant event going on currently in the world. And I think that that's, you know, I think that's, they understood it as a very powerful statement, and I think we all do too. Also, they do not refer to these as Berliners in Berlin because it would be extremely confusing. You know, it's like, ich hätte gern zwei Berliner, I want two Berliners. Well, which two do you want? I mean, there's a lot of them here. They call them Pfannkuchen in, in Berlin, by the way. And they're quite delicious. So, thank you all for coming. Almost everybody here must know. My name's John Foster. I'm a reference librarian here at Mentor Public Library. I have a doctorate in history from the University of Washington. My specialty is... Germany and the history of the Cold War, or Germany, modern Germany. Really, modern Germany takes you from the German unification in 1871 all the way up. Uh, this isn't in my sort of normal schedule of talks. I scheduled this one kind of at the last minute because of all the stuff that's going on in Eastern Europe right now, uh, especially the Russo-Ukrainian war that's going on. Because I, one of the things that people have talked about a lot is, so there's a sort of narrative about the war that one reason that Vladimir Putin chose to invade Ukraine was because he felt threatened by NATO expansion and by EU expansion. And there's, these, these things are not, I mean, this, this, this is not an implausible idea. Uh, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about what my take on that. And, you know, let me just say that I, I try very hard when I give these talks not to, to in, inject my own politics. It's, it's bad news to preach politics from the lectern because you're a captive audience. If you want to hear my political views, it'll cost you a beer or two um, and be done in some other venue. But I will, like, I have, a, I have a sort of take on the narrative which I will give at the end, and if people think I'm uh, way off base, you're, you're welcome to, to express that too. NATO today. NATO is, comprises 30 member states. Uh, originally, it was 12. We can talk a little about its foundation in 1949. Its civilian budget is $289 million. Uh, the military budget is about $1.5, $1.6 billion. Or euros, excuse me, thank you. I, as a matter of fact, I put in the euro sign just to give, <laughs> give myself a reminder, which I signally failed to take up. 
The United States pays annually about $320 million to keep NATO going. The United States pays 16.34% of the cost. Germany also pays 16% of the cost. Uh, the UK pays 11. The French pay 10. Italy, 8. Canada, 6. Uh, the rest of the countries pay smaller amounts. $320 million sounds like a lot of money until you realize that the U.S. military budget, the Pentagon's budget, is $820 billion. So $320 million is a rounding error. I mean, it's, you know, a, a, a billion here, a billion there, and soon you're talking real money. That's, um, so the question is, you don't want to just spend $300 million on nothing. And, and, and during, the, during the Trump administration, there was a sort of feeling expressed by uh, Mr. Trump and some of his associates that the situation with NATO had to change or that Europe had to pay more money. So one of the questions you'll want to sort of have in the back of your mind is, what is it that we are getting for our $320 million and is it worth it? And that's, that's a legitimate question to ask. Uh, the current NATO General Secretary is Jens Stoltenberg. He was for about eight years, I believe, the Prime Minister of Norway. The NATO uh, SACUR, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, is General Todd Walters. He's an Air Force General, four-star general. Generally, SACUR is an American. The longest serving one was Laurel, uh, I can't remember his name, is the first one, but, but the, there was a big sort of debate that went on in the 1950s about whether he was an American general or whether he was uh, a NATO general. And actually, uh, Todd Walters is both. He's also the commander of US forces in Europe, so he wears two hats, and he lives in a really beautiful villa in Mons in Belgium, which I thought about putting in as a picture, but then <laughs> thought about something else. The North Atlantic Treaty was signed on April 4th, 1949. This was the treaty that put together NATO. And why was it signed? Why did people want to sign on to it? Well, the number one feeling was, so since the end of the Second World War, and actually before the end of the Second World War, really starting in about 1943, the Allied powers had started to think, well, what's going to happen after the war is over? And what came pretty quickly to their mind was, what's the Red Army going to do once the war is over? And there's a story, I've, I've told it in some other talks, but uh, this is one of my favorite sort of Cold War uh, anecdotes. And it, it, it's been told a bunch of different ways, but, uh, but I know that Harry Truman told the story thusly, that he was at the Potsdam Conference. It must have been fairly early in the conference because Churchill was there too. You probably where Churchill was voted out of office in the middle of the Potsdam Conference. But... The, the leaders are sitting around at a table, Churchill and Truman and Stalin. And uh, so Stalin had sort of unilaterally moved Poland about 200 miles to the west. Uh, like he had taken, he had sort of said, the eastern section of Poland is now going to be Russia, and we're going to give Poland territory out of the eastern part of Germany up to what was referred to as the oder neisse line. You'll see here, sometimes hear older Germans refer to it as the Sogananta oder neisse line, the so-called oder neisse line, um, because he certainly didn't ask anybody about doing it. And anyway, so the Potsdam conference is going on, and, um, and Churchill raises the point that the Pope was unhappy about the treatment of Catholics in eastern Poland, and Stalin was kind of bemused, the, the Pope? The Pope? How many divisions does the Pope have? Uh, and it was a very clear statement by Stalin about what kinds of things he thought mattered, right? And whose opinion he cared about. So, you know, the Pope, that's, that's nice. But if you don't have 150 divisions or something that can cope with 150 divisions, because I do, like, so I'm going to make the decisions based on what I want, not what the Pope might want. However, you know, however that might play out. And this really reaffirmed to the Western allies that, you know, communism is a threat. We had been allied with the Soviets. And in fact, there's a good argument to be made. I mean, I, I love Band of Brothers. My grandfather was a tank commander in the Second World War, fought in the Battle of the Bulge. But the, really, the Russians defeated the, the Wehrmacht in, in a very real sense. I mean, less than half a million Americans were killed in total in the Second World War. More than 20 million Russians were killed. And the Red Army's tactics were pretty brutal. I mean, they involved like frontal, massed frontal charges. Uh, 
And then if you happen to make them, Stalin once said you had to be really brave to be a, to be a coward in the Red Army because if you showed any sign of cowardice, you would just be shot or you would be stuck in a punishment battalion, one of the duties of which was to run through the minefield to clear a path for the troops behind you. This is 100% verifiable fact. So the Red Army is this very powerful force. It's occupying the eastern part of Germany. It's occupying a large part of, of Austria and Hungary and the eastern part of Europe. And the Allies were already quite concerned about what exactly the situation was going to be because, you know, it was pretty clear that uh, there was very little stopping Stalin from heading for the English Channel if that was where he wanted to go. But that was, in the, that was in the moment immediately at the end of the war. In the course of the late 1940s, what you have is it becomes clear that Stalin doesn't want to take Europe militarily. What he does want to do is set up a, a zone of influence that's his sort of zone of influence. So he sets up uh, the communist parties in Poland, in Hungary, in East Germany, in Czechoslovakia to basically uh, exert the power of the Red Army without using military force. And he, there's this sort of interesting moment with Molotov where Molotov, the foreign minister, uh, he gets called in by, by Truman and Truman, you know, essentially uh, calls him a liar because they've been, they've been sort of setting up these kind of sort of puppet states. And Molotov is shocked. There's a, there's a sort of story and it may be apocryphal, but it really sort of like illustrates something important in which Molotov says, well, I've never been talked to like that again. And Truman says, well, or never been talked to like that before. And Truman says, if you keep your agreements, you'll never get talked to like that again. But Molotov was legitimately shocked because he thought that what they were doing was essentially what we were doing. That we had come in on the side of the anti-communist forces in the Greek civil war. That we had come in on the side of the anti-communist uh, political parties in the Italian elections. And he really thought, you know, there's a, there's, he has this note in his diary, Molotov, Poland, what a big deal. Like, why are, that, why are the Westerners so concerned? Like, that's, you know, that's our area. Like, you can do what you want in your area. That's our area. And, you know, th there's a legitimate case to be made, even if you're not thinking about, like, irrespective of whether you believe that, that, that ultimately they want to sort of, like, spread communism everywhere. There's, a, you know, clearly they, that was part of the, the deal. But even if you didn't think that, right, like, still, it's, it's not unreasonable, given what's just happened, for Stalin to say, well, I think I want a little padding between me and you guys, since, you know, between, like, Napoleon and, uh, and this, and, you know, the First World War, we've gotten invaded a bunch of times, and, and maybe we want to, you know, maybe it's not an illegitimate idea to, to put up a sort of buffer zone, if you will. So, by 1949... So in 1948, he allows the Czech Communist Party to stage a coup and essentially take over Czechoslovakia. And that was a sort of concession at that point that they weren't going to be able to, you know, Stalin kept saying, you know, to the, to the communist parties in the Eastern states, like, come out and tell people, like, all this, you know, you fought fascism, like, you, you know, we're rebuilding the country. And, and it, it wasn't selling for reasons that probably I don't need to explain. But so at a certain point, he just says to the Czech Communist Party, okay, go ahead and take over. Now, at the same time, the communists in East Germany have forcibly unified themselves with the Social Democrats uh, into uh, what was called for the remainder of the life of East Germany, the SED, or the Socialist Unity Party, Sozialistische Einheitspartei Deutschland. Um, and they're busily sort of like building a, a, a state, which Stalin really doesn't want. Stalin absolutely didn't want the formation of East Germany, and when it happened, he was really upset about it, because what he wanted was Germany as unified and neutral. And he was very annoyed at the German communists for having sort of, you know, it's so hard to get good henchmen, I think is the, is the upshot here. What the, what the Allied powers were most worried about was not that the Red Army was going to go was going to head to the channel. What they were worried about was that the communists would threaten Western European countries, and the Western Euro European countries would become neutral. And that was the thing that they were really most alarmed about. They, they wanted to fight off communism, and they were fighting a sort of multi-front multi battle against communism, one part of which was the Marshall Plan, right? So the reason that they 
gave this gigantic aid package to, to Western Europe. They offered it to Eastern Europe, but Stalin told the Eastern Europeans that they had to say no. But the reason they were doing it was not out of some sort of soft-hearted desire to, to, you know, to uplift the Europeans, but because they wanted capitalism to work right. And it was a kind of an artesian well theory, right? So that the, the problem in the 20s and 30s was that capitalism hadn't worked very well. You'd had this horrendous depression starting in 1929, which actually the sort of proximate uh, cause of the bank run that really got it going was the, was the default of, or the collapse of a bank called the Kreditanstalt in Austria. The sort of general thinking in those days was, and the, 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 this is not an unreasonable position, I think, when you look at it, that one of the reasons that communism looked good was, well, A, look, the Red Army had basically vanquished the Wehrmacht, but B, capitalism had worked so badly in the, in the 20s and 30s that communism looked like a better idea than it actually was. So what they wanted to do was make sure that people didn't take it into their heads that, that you know, maybe we should just be neutral. There was, they were really worried that the Germans were going were to, that the West Germans were going to go neutral, right? Um, because they thought, and this idea they sort of persisted in for a long time, that the number one goal that the Germans would have would be reunification. This turned out not to be the case for reasons we'll get into in a bit. But so you have uh, the 12 NATO states, the United States, Iceland, Norway, Great Britain, West Germany. West Germany gets added slightly later. France, Italy. Spain gets added slightly later, too. Why? Because they were a little hinky about Franco. Franco had stayed neutral during the Second World War, not because he didn't think that Hitler was a fine guy, but because he didn't want the English to, to mess up his shipping and, and other things. Uh, same way with Portugal. Portugal under Salazar, sort of fascism light in, a, in an unfortunate sort of way. So you have Switzerland and Austria not included because they're both neutral. You have Yugoslavia, which is outside the Iron Curtain because Tito and, and Stalin can't stand each other. As a matter of fact, Stalin tried to have Tito assassinated on two occasions, and after the second one, Tito sent him a letter saying, if you do that again, I'm going to send an assassin after you, and I won't have to send a second one. And, uh, so, uh, and you know, Tito was an old guerrilla fighter. He, he, you know, he knew his business, so it, and Stalin, I think, understood that it was probably best to lay off. And then you can see, like, West Berlin... Uh, right there. Uh, Turkey is in the mix. Greece is in the mix. Yeah, why NATO? Once again, defense. Make sure that the Red Army just doesn't waltz to the Channel Coast. Although, once again, this was really not Stalin's inclination. Because they'd been fighting a brutal war for a long time. You know, they, Germany invades Russia in 1940. Uh, and the Red Army, first of all, the Red Army has just had its, like, most of its competent leadership purged and executed. Uh, so they fared very badly, pretty much up until the point of Stalingrad, at which point the tide turned. But a lot of the reason was that they, you know, they traded space for time, and they learned as they went. They learned very brutal lessons, and in a very unfortunate way. But uh, neutrality, the fear that countries will turn neutral. The Cold War, once again, the defining feature of post-war politics is the, the struggle between liberal democracy on one side, communism on the other, the Czechoslovakian coup. Uh, Hastings Ismay is the first general secretary of NATO. He's a, he's a colleague of Winston Churchill, pug to his friends. And he says at one point that the purpose of uh, NATO is keeping the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Um, but he really, he really felt that this was, you know, he says this kind of kind of sadly, he wasn't, he wasn't sort of exultant about it. I mean, it was really the, the politics after the Second World War changed very quickly so that the British, who had kind of felt like, okay, hey, we're partners here, once the, the sort of arsenal of democracy really gets going, uh, the U.S. government, the U.S. military wants to listen to them less and less. Now, Field Marshal Montgomery was definitely uh, uh, very much involved in the actual fighting and in the latter stages of the war. But by and large, uh, Churchill feels very kind of pushed out. And then, of course, Churchill is pushed out of his own government uh, almost in the first election after the, after the end of the war. So what happens almost immediately is a series of crises. 
The first of which has been brewing in Korea since 1948, but really gets cracking in the summer of 1950, in June, late June, when 135,000 uh, North Korean communist troops uh, cross into South Korea and start uh, engaging the South Korean army, which is not in very good shape at that point. They get pushed back uh, fairly quickly. Uh, Truman is caught kind of on the hop by this. And he is in a little bit of a quandary about what to do because he doesn't know if the American people are interested in fighting another war. I mean, we just got done five years earlier with a war that had been very costly in terms of, of, of human lives and, men, you know, and materiel. In Korea, I mean, most Americans at that point probably couldn't have found Korea on a map. And so the question was, what are we going to do about it? And Truman says, well, you know, we've got to oppose, we've got to oppose communism. We've got to, you know, we've got to make us, this is where the fight is, so we're going, to, we're going to fight it here. On the day after the invasion, Truman directs MacArthur to evacuate American dependents and to uh, move forces to uh, assist the Army of the Republic of Korea. What then happens, you've, you've you know, if, you've, if you know about the conflict, the Republic of Korea forces and the U.S. forces get pushed uh, back into a perimeter around the, the southern city of Busan. Uh, things don't look very good. They, there's a change of leadership in the U.S. leadership. They bring in Ridgway, Matt Ridgway. Yes, thank you. I keep wanting to say Mark Clark, and I know, that, I know that's wrong, but that's the only word that will come in my mouth. Matt Ridgway. Uh, Matt Ridgway, the first thing he did when he, got was he, when he got there was change the regimental linens. And the reason was, he was like, if we're going to do this, we're going to have pride in what we're doing. This isn't going to be like, you know, fooling around here. This is going to be a serious army fighting a serious war. And, you know, we're going to do everything the way the U.S. military really does it. And Ridgway really pulled the fat out of the fire. But what happens eventually is, uh, I mean, and the thing that really turns it is MacArthur staging his uh, landing at Inchon up on the coast uh, right near Seoul, uh, cutting off a large proportion of the, of the North Korean forces. They retreat. The U.S. Army uh, chases them up to the border. And then there's this talk about, you know, are we going to use, are we going to, you know, get in with China? Because we don't really, there's a question about like what kind of war are we interested in fighting. At a certain point, Truman is, they come to him and say, well, you know, maybe we should consider nu using nuclear weapons. And Truman says, well, I, I, I've dropped one bomb, or I've, two, I've, I've used it once, I'm not going to do it again. So we're going to, at this point too, this, I, I may get this quote right. MacArthur sort of goes on a speaking tour because he doesn't think that sufficient means are being or being put as uh, disposal. And he writes a letter which he had, which it gets read out in Congress. And finally, Truman's had enough and he cans him. And he says, uh, I didn't fire him for being a stupid son of a bitch. That's, you know, if you're going to fire generals, that's not against the law for generals. If it was, three quarters of them be in jail. Um, <laughs> Mac MacArthur, brilliant as he was, had clearly exceeded his brief, and he couldn't, Truman couldn't allow him to be sort of militating outside the chain of command in the way that he was. The reason why we're talking about this is NATO gets sort of involved in this, and one reason is because, now it's an interesting case uh, in, this, in the following sense. The key thing to know about the North Atlantic Treaty is Article 5. Article 5 says that an attack on any one of the member states of NATO is to be regarded as an attack on all, and all states are then tasked with doing whatever they can to assist in re rebutting the attack. So there are some sort of forces from, uh, I mean, the idea is that there's a the NATO element, although in fact it's a sort of coalition of the willing. Um, although the Turks did send a, a pretty fair contingent as, as far as it goes. Ultimately, what happens is there's a, there's a very complicated politics that goes on between the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, Stalin is really avid for this to happen. And Mao doesn't want to, you know, Mao kind of says, well, you know, and this is another sort of pressure on Truman, of course, like the, the, the West had, so, so to speak, like lost China. China had fallen to the communists under Mao. Mao sort of thinks to himself, well, and he says, I thought to himself, um, the Russians are the sort of like senior partner here, so we, you know, we're going to do, we're going to sort of do what they say. The Chinese then invade, push us back down uh, the peninsula, push the U.S. forces 
uh, back down the peninsula. And then there's a stalemate that goes on for two years, essentially, of, you know, of negotiations. Both sides, the leaders of both sides, that is to say, Syngman Rhee, the leader of South Korea, and Kim Il-sung, the leader of North Korea, are adamant that they, the, the, the conflict has to go on until like, they're, like, the whole of Korea is liberated one way or the other. And then finally, much to everyone's relief, Stalin dies in 1953. And uh, the, the parties finally sort of recognize that the, they're at a stalemate. They, they divide the country in two, uh, and it remained the, that way to this day. Now, Stalin's death is an important moment for NATO, right? Because Stalin, so he dies in 1953. Then there's this sort of period where it's unclear what's happening. What does happen in uh, 1955 is that West Germany is then added to NATO. So there's this feeling that uh, in order to keep the Germans on side, right, in order to keep the Germans from deciding to become neutral and reunify the country under sort of Soviet auspices, that they'll include West Germany in NATO. And I have the number here. I can never remember exactly. So this happens on uh, the 9th of May, 1955. Uh, on the 14th of May, 1955, the Warsaw Pact is formed. And the two things are intimately connected. So that, you know, Stalin decided, or not Stalin, oh, Khrushchev by that point. Khrushchev, it, it, took him a, it took him a little while to get into power. And eventually, it took him a while. They, the, the sort of not, uh, communist hardliners, Stalinist hardliners, tried to stage a coup uh, in 1955, which, which, which Khrushchev saw off. And then he sort of moved them out of the picture. So Molotov, who had been the sort of leading foreign minister under Stalin, was made, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, the ambassador to Mongolia, um, which is, is the only thing they could have done more to get rid of him would be to hang up a banner saying, like, please retire now. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to guess that Mongolia is not the most cherry diplomatic assignment that you could get. But in 1956, so there's a kind of a thaw that goes on when Khrushchev gets into power. Khrushchev says to the, to the, communist, the Eastern European Communist Party, he's like, we need to try and sort of get people on our side. So we're going to, there's going to be a little more sort of latitude, right? And uh, the result is that there's this uprising in Hungary in October of 1956, led by a communist leader named Imre Naj. He was a little bit unorthodox, and he'd been purged a couple of times and come back. But he gets to be this leader of, the, of, this pos, of this popular uprising. There's a kind of a loosening. And then the, once the cat is out of the bag, people start really saying what they think about the Communist Party, which is mostly not very nice. The uh, Russians have to come in. The Russians have to step in, suppress the whole thing. Uh, Naj is taken away and executed. But it's one of those moments that you would think that would really activate NATO, right? But it didn't. And the reason was because at almost the same time, the French, the British, and the Israelis had concocted what can only be described as a harebrained scheme to retake the Suez Canal. In the middle of uh, 1956, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the nationalist leader of Egypt, had nationalized the Suez Canal. And that's a big deal. I mean, number one, the, the British and the French were annoyed because they had paid to make it. But number two, uh, a very large proportion of the energy resources that Great Britain used throughout, the, throughout the, uh, the Commonwealth came through the Suez Canal. So this is a big, a big deal. So the French and the British and the Israelis get together and they come up with this plan. And the plan is that the Israelis will invade and then the French and the British will come in to protect the canal. So essentially what they, the idea was that we'll create this crisis, like one part of our set here will create this crisis, and the other two will come in to fix the crisis. This is a very common strategy in politics. And, um, but uh, they didn't count on a few things. Number one, the Egyptian uh, resistance was more stout than they expected. But number two, 
Eisenhower was really annoyed by the whole thing. And he told the British that uh, if they didn't back off, like that he was essentially going to allow sanctions to happen against them. And the British were very shocked by this, right? Because they thought like, oh, you know, the special relationship. But the, but the US government thought that it was destabilizing the area, that it was creating an opportunity uh, for the communists to make uh, sort of political hay out of the whole thing. And so Eisenhower and Dulles basically let the, let the French and the British know that, that they have to stop. And the, the British and the French have to back down. The Israelis back down slightly more slowly. Uh, I think they occupied the, the Sinai for another year or more after that. But essentially, the point of the U.S. response was, we don't need to create other problems. You know, we already have, we've just sorted out the Korea thing. The French have gotten sort of moved out of Indochina at uh, a fantastic cost in loss of life and money. The French spent more money losing Indochina than they got from the Marshall Plan. So ultimately, the, the point for the Americans is we need to stay focused here. We need to stay focused on the central issue, which is Europe. Now, around this time, Charles de Gaulle comes back on the scene in France with the collapse of the Fourth Republic. Uh, de Gaulle was a really prickly individual that nobody liked, as far as, as I can tell. As I, if I recall correctly, Roosevelt told Churchill that he would consent to anyone else running free France besides de Gaulle, you know, like, didn't care, you know, involved with Vichy, doesn't matter, like, I just don't want that guy. But as it turned out, de Gaulle was the guy. He was the leader of the Free French. He was very conservative, had a very pronounced dislike of Anglo-Saxons. Um, there's, there's just no way of getting around it. So he becomes fairly quickly uh, dissatisfied with the way NATO is running. And he, number one, uh, the French are fighting now a colonial war in Algeria. And that's a much different proposition than the war that they had fought in Indochina. Indochina was a colony and it was worth a lot to them. Algeria was a department of France. Algeria was like, I mean, they considered it, now the, the Arab Algerians thought of it somewhat differently, but since they all had to be educated with textbooks entitled Our Gallic Ancestors. Um, but the, the, the French really viewed Algeria as a, a, an actual part of France in a way that they never viewed Indochina. They never viewed uh, their Far Eastern possessions. De Gaulle writes this letter in which he says, the Atlantic Alliance was conceived in its uh, recent events in the Middle East uh, and in the Straits of Formosa, there'd been conflict between communist China threatening to re-annex Taiwan, have contributed to show that the present organization of the Western Alliance no longer corresponds to the necessary conditions of security as far as the whole of the free world is concerned. The sharing of the risks incurred is not matched by indispensable cooperation on decisions taken and on responsibilities. From this, the French government is led to draw conclusions and make several propositions. And the propositions essentially were this. So right in the early 50s, the British had gotten with the US government and sort of said, OK, we all speak English. You know, we have a special relationship. So you know, we want to be sort of like working together on things. We'd like you to sort of share nuclear technology. And the, the US government is, is mostly OK with this because we're relatively sympathetic to their situation. But what de Gaulle says is, number one, uh, we need to change the structure of NATO so that the British and the United States and the French form a sort of tripartite leadership group. This, what this, this turn of events is often referred to as tripartitism. What he, what de Gaulle proposes over the course of the next couple of years is that they want to, he says, well, you know, what we need to do is split up the world into zones of, of influence. So ours will be Africa and the U.S. can have the Far East and the British can have the Commonwealth. And we'll make decisions about things and then we'll let the other people in NATO know. Well, Eisenhower is, is completely uninterested in this idea. And he keeps trying to find ways to sort of get de Gaulle off it, but de Gaulle won't leave it alone. De Gaulle feels like they're fighting the front lines of communism in Algeria. 
because there was a sort of leftist dimension to the to the Algerian to the to the to the FLN in Algeria, partly because the Russians had sort of decided that their thing was going to be anti-colonial struggle. So if you're like they didn't they didn't want to march into the middle of Europe. What they wanted to do was detract from European power by supporting these anti-colonial struggles uh, so that the, the, the otherwise legitimate anti-colonial struggles get wrapped up with this sort of Cold War filter, if you will. And it's debatable how communist the, the Algerian rebels were, but, but de Gaulle's position vis-a-vis -vis the US government is, we're fighting the, the war against communism now, you need to help us. Eisenhower is completely, completely uninterested in this, in this idea. And he keeps, now at the same time, there's a sort of faction within the US State Department. And one of the things that's also getting talked about is nuclear weapons. So the United States now has a pretty considerable nuclear arsenal. The French want NATO to be given power over these nuclear weapons or over some portion of them, right? Because they say like, look, if the Germans are, or if the Russians are invading, we don't want to have to call someone up to find out if we can launch a, a strike, right? We want to just be able to do it. Now, there's a kind of a balance to be built here, right? Because although Eisenhower doesn't want to be handing out nuclear weapons, that is say putting nuclear weapons under the control of, of other governments, at the same time, what he also does not want is for France to start developing its own nuclear weapons. And he also, another sort of reason for his opposition to the kind of tripartite thing is his feeling that other countries, and by other countries here we mean West Germany, will feel like they've been sort of made a second or possibly a third class citizen, right, by uh, being sort of shut out of the highest level. Now, there's a faction within the State Department that thinks that the fundamental thing motivating Germans is the desire for reunification. So what we want to do, what needs to happen is, uh, we need to give the Germans nuclear weapons so that A, they won't develop nuclear weapons on their own, that's a, that's a, that's a major concern, but B, so they'll feel like they're part of the team, right? Because what they, you know, what they really want is this unification, so we have to give them something else. As it turns out, as the U.S. government uh, State Department officials get out into Germany, what they discover is that by the late 1950s, early 1960s, this is Germany under Konrad Adenauer. Konrad Adenauer, former mayor of Cologne, uh, relatively conservative Catholic. And he had sort of uh, faced off the German Social Democrats, who were very politically powerful after the end of the Second World War, uh, by engineering, essentially, what's referred to nowadays as the economic miracle, the Wirtschaftswunder. And by 1958, Germans are doing pretty good. And they really don't care, as it turns out, that much about reunification. They've got good jobs, right? They're, making, they're saving money. This is something Germans love to do. They love to save money. They have a pretty good thing going here. They don't really want nuclear weapons. And as it turns out, uh, later on, uh, when Adenauer is sort of leaving power in 1963, he tells, I think Dulles, but I'm, no, Dulles is dead by this point. He tells someone in the US State Department, you know, you guys kept offering, kept sort of back-channeling us this offer for nuclear weapons, which we didn't want. But we also didn't want to say no, because we didn't want to offend you, right? You're offering us nuclear weapons. So if you'd said, if you'd come out publicly and offered us nuclear weapons, we would have had to say yes, but please, you know, find a way to not offer us nuclear weapons anymore, because we don't want them, right? Because, you know, we're doing fine here. We're not like, we're not going to go neutral. Why would we want to do that? Like, East Germany stinks. Like we're, you know, we're doing great here. What we want to be is part of the NATO uh, organization so that we can have a part in, in our own defense, but we don't want up the tension here. We don't want to have nuclear weapons. 1958, by the way, then Khrushchev comes out and says to the US government, uh, you've got six months to get all your troops out of Berlin, out of West Berlin. And if you don't, we're gonna sign a peace treaty Technically, the Second World War was going on, still going on in some sense, with East Germany. And then the fact of the matter is, Berlin, West Berlin, East Berlin, it's all part of East Germany. And this, this conflict rumbles on until 1961. And the NATO leadership, they start a sort of planning group called Fair Oak. And they're trying to come up with ways that they're going to respond to this, right? The US idea is, well, if the, if the Russians try and seize Berlin, 
We'll send two divisions, two armored divisions up one of the, so there's three Autobahns that go from West Germany to, to West Berlin. We'll send two armored divisions. And the, the British like, well, we had a sort of more slimmed down idea in which we'd send a couple of battalions up there just to sort of make the point. And, and the US government says, well, no, I mean, we really want to sort of make it rather more forcefully, to which the British say, well, what's your plan here? Is your plan just to run them in a straight line up the Autobahn, that's a bad idea. Or is your plan to spread out, you know, and then be violating East German sovereign territory? And to which the US government says, we'll work that out when it, when it comes. But, you know, what we're not gonna have is the Soviets dictating to us what the situation with West Germany is gonna be, or the, what the dis situation with West Berlin is gonna be. And it, it, it sort of burbles on and burbles on until 1961, several months previously, the. I think it was Walter Obrecht, the, the leader of East Germany, had said, well, nobody's going to build a wall. And then, of course, this is exactly what they do. They show up and they build this wall. These are people who live in a building that's sort of on one side voting with their feet. This is a East German border guard named Schumann who, he was sort of standing there at one of these points they were putting up, and there's a bunch of people, he kind of sort of back out of frame, shouting for him to jump over. And he figures now is the time, right? And this is one of my favorite images because, you know, what would you do? Like, yeah, now is the time. Communism is happening. I'm out of here. And he ended up having a, a, a fairly, uh, a, a quite decent life in West Germany, although I think that he ended up committing suicide because I think that he felt guilty about the people who hadn't been able to get out of East Germany in the way that he had. Um, but once again, like, this is one of those sort of moments where, you know, someone really follows their instincts and just gets the hell out. Um, and you, you gotta respect that. Uh, de Gaulle, finally, in 1966, pulls France out of the NATO military structure. They stay in the organization, but they pull out of the, out of the military structure of NATO, and he tells the U.S. government that they need to, that all U.S. military personnel need to start leaving France, to which Dean Rusk says, well, should we disinter the 50,000 U.S. soldiers who are buried there? Uh, and de Gaulle understood that that wasn't a serious whatever, but Rusk was making the point, like, we spent a lot of, like, you know, it's not like we'd never committed anything to France, like, a lot of Americans died to free France, so... It's kind of a jerk move on your part. The French stayed out of the NATO um, military structure until 2009. Sarkozy brought them in back in 2009. After the mid 60s, things are mostly fairly quiet NATO wise. The Cold War kind of settles down. The sort of late Cold War is a little less hot than it had been, with the exception of Vietnam, of course, right? And Vietnam is another sort of Russian, Chinese, you know, the Russians and the Chinese thought that the Vietnam War was really great because it involved like the US spending blood and money and it cost them relatively little. But that was, that was sort of the way it was at that point. I mean, it really became sort of proxy wars, mostly outside of NATO's environment. Why? Because in order for NATO to get involved, Article 5 has to get triggered. And in Vietnam, Article 5 did not get triggered, right? Because the, the people getting attacked were South Vietnam, was the, was the Republic of South Vietnam. We were just sort of on site to help them. So Article 5 wouldn't get triggered. And in fact, the US government always wanted NATO to be Europe-centered. You know, the United States government was always about a narrow interpretation of NATO. With the end of the Cold War, when communism collapses in 1989-90, NATO begins to expand or enlarge. NATO enlargement is the other term for this. And you can kind of see the sort of phases in which it happens. So it's founded in 49. You get 55 is when West Germany uh, comes in. 1982 is when they finally uh, allow Spain to join. Uh, Franco is now out of the picture. And then you get these post Cold War, so to speak, expansions. The first one uh, starting in, in 1990 and then the Visegrad group in 1999. Now there's 1990, uh, a unified Germany becomes a member of NATO. And in the negotiations for this, this is a very key moment for what's going on now. Uh, James Baker is talking to Gorbachev about German reunification and Baker says, well, 
You know, if you allow German, German reunification, then NATO will not move one inch eastward. Uh, he makes this proposal to him. And Gorbachev says, well, yeah, I'll think about it. And then later, German reunification does happen relatively soon after that. There's a treaty sign, but no mention of this one inch later, one inch east, further eastward thing is made. As a matter of fact, it's never mentioned again until somewhat later when the Visegrad group, which is Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, that's 1999. At this point, the Russians start to get fairly upset about what's going on. And not without, I mean, you can kind of see why they would find this alarming, right? Because NATO has always been, when, the purpose of NATO has always been anti-Russian by their lights, right? It was, I mean, it was anti-communist, but, you know, splitting the two, uh, as far as they were concerned, you know, there's a very pronounced anti-Russian aspect to this. March 2004, uh, you get the big NATO expansion. You get Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia. In the intervening period, there's been this war in, the, in Yugoslavia where uh, a sort of uh, resurgent Serbian state has decided that it's going to sort of reclaim greater Serbia, so to speak. And it starts up in 1994, and NATO then decides that, I mean, there's a series of fairly horrific incidences of uh, mass killing, of ethnic cleansing, uh, both in uh, Bosnia, uh, and then eventually also in Kosovo. Again, remember actually a friend of mine who was from, who I think was Croatian, telling me when the whole, the, the Bosnian thing was going on, he was like, well, okay, this is bad, but the thing that's brewing up is Kosovo, and the, trust me, the Serbs care a lot more about that. Like, Kosovo has this place in Serbian history going back hundreds of years. Um, Serbs decide that they're going to sort of remake Kosovo into part of greater Serbia, minus the, the Albanian population. And NATO decides to step into this. And it's always one of the sort of points of debate and one of the reasons that the Russians are very hinky about NATO is why? Like, what was the justification? Because there's nothing in this that triggers an Article 5, that triggers Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. But what there is is people in concentration camps, people being, you know, mass murdered, especially in Srebrenica, but, but not only there. So NATO, first of all, starts with a kind of strategic bombing campaign. Before this, by the way, NATO had been, the only other NATO uh, military operations had been uh, guarding oil supplies in Kuwait during the first Iraq war. So this was the first real NATO uh, military engagement after the, after the end of the Cold War. But uh, Operation Joint Guard in Bosnia-Herzegovina and then Operation Allied Force, that's the big one. That, that triggers strategic bombing. There's this really, so by this point, well, I'll show you some pictures. This is Boris Yeltsin uh, in the Russian Duma, very upset about NATO expansion, saying basically, we were told that NATO, NATO wasn't gonna expand east, and yet they're doing it. And, and this sort of like sets in motion this narrative of Russian, um, Russian sort of victimization, if you will. So this is Allied, Operation Allied Force, but undertaken between March and June 1999. This is Novi Sad in flames. Uh, this is a Tomahawk cruise missile being launched from the USS Gonzalez. This is the, um, the Serbian Ministry of Communications, I believe, looking somewhat the worse for wear. This is the anti-aircraft fire over Belgrade. This is, I, I just like this as a sort of picture of, of what Allied air power can do. This is Wesley Clark. Wesley Car Clark is a U.S. general. He was a West Pointer, not surprisingly, since most generals are. Uh, he had fought in Vietnam. He won the Silver Star. And he was SACUR at this point. He was uh, a Supreme Allied Commander Europe. And he, I really recommend his book, Fighting Modern War. It came out in 2001. He's written a number of books, but I think Fighting Modern War is the best in which he's, <laughs> at a certain point, they were negotiating with, with uh, Milosevic, Slobodan Milosevic, the, the, the president of Serbia, to get Serbian troops out of Kosovo. And um, at a certain point, Clark tells this story where they were at some meeting and he sort of took Milosevic aside and said to him, look, if, if you don't get your troops out, 
my government is going to order me to bomb you, and I am going to bomb you good. Uh, and I really like that as a sort of, I mean, this is the kind of, the, when, the, when, the, when the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe tells you something like that, that's the kind of thing that should get your attention, because he has access to a lot of firepower. Now, it's complicated because they've got to clear all the missions through the NATO command structure, which is very complicated. Um, but this is the uh, radar station outside of uh, Pristina in Kosovo, a Serbian radar station. And that's what it looked like beforehand, and that's what it looked like afterward, and there's really just nothing there. So there's this is a sort of constant debate or a sort of long-running debate about you know, was the, was the intervention, was the air war in Kosovo, was it legitimate? Well, it's problematic vis-a-vis -vis international law because, once again, what could have triggered Article 5? The NATO basically argued that there was a kind of uh, exigent emergency, that there was a humanitarian disaster going on, they had to do something. And, and once again, NATO really, the sort of uh, institutional ethos of NATO is Europe-focused. Also, and this is not unimportant in the whole situation, Serbia is and has been for more than a century a Russian client state. I mean, like, uh, cast your mind back uh, the summer of 1914 uh, when a Serbian nationalist killed the Austrian Archduke and his wife in Sarajevo. The sort of proximate event after that was, first of all, the, the Austrians demanding some kind of a pound of flesh, if you will, from the Serbians. That's probably an inappropriate term. What, what I mean is the Austrians demanding sort of that the Serbians make good on, on this whole thing and the Russians coming in on the side of the Serbs. The Germans were then in on the side of the Austrians. The French were then on the side of the Russians. And here we go. The, this is a very simplified explanation. By the way, Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers has been getting a lot of talk lately with its connection to the Ukraine situation. Uh, Christopher Clark, the author, Christopher Clark's a British historian. He wrote this book called The Sleepwalkers about the, the origins of, of World War I. It's the state of the art. It's an absolutely fabulous book. He says that, it, you know, he doesn't think it's a good sort of comparison, but I, I really recommend the, the Sleepwalkers as a book to read. It's really if you're interested in, in European history and the origins of the First World War. And just the way European politics works, because there's a lot of similarities in that respect in any, in any case. What subsequently happens is then uh, NATO sets up what's called K4, uh, where they have military patrols in Kosovo to try and keep Kosovo Albanians and the Kosovo Serbs from, from having at each other. This is, these are German K4 troops. You can kind of see where it says K4. So, as you're probably well aware, uh, NATO is having uh, one of its general meetings right now, its general summits, uh, in Madrid, started today. And of course, the situation in Ukraine is very prominent in everybody's minds. Now, one thing that had happened when the Russians invaded Ukraine, so there was some thought that Ukraine might join the EU. They had sort of made some sort of, they nearly joined the EU before the before the uh, Maidan Square thing happened. Um, they had signed a kind of like an agreement to have an agreement. There was also some talk that, that Ukraine might join NATO. I think that was a much more sort of remote prospect in, in fact. But what happened was the Swedes and uh, the Finns did apply to join NATO immediately. Uh, the Swedes had always been neutral. They'd been neutral since the Second World War. The Finns uh, had, for a long time, had to sort of, I mean, they share, a, I think, a 1,300 mile long border with, with Russia. And they've always had to sort of tread carefully where the Russians are involved. So that they're, they have been sort of not quite neutral, but they've had to sort of take Russia's opinions into account. But the Finns then said, they announced, and this was a couple of months ago, they were like, well, We've made much more preparations than the Ukrainians did. So, you know, if the Russians are, you know, want to come test it out here, we're ready, uh, which should be an alarming thing. Vladimir Putin is a sort of interesting, is, is a very interesting character. Uh, and he very much is into the idea of recouping Russian greatness. He's very open about this. And he really sees 
NATO and EU expansion as a threat to his, as a threat to Russia's power. And there's a, there's a sense in which he's right, although um, it's, it's also arguable that there's other ways to, I mean, so one of the problems with Ukraine was, Ukraine had this government uh, that was essentially a Russian, they were essentially a Russian client state. Ukraine, interestingly, is somewhat culturally separate from Russia. There's a really great book by a Ukrainian scholar named Serhii Ploky called uh, The Gates of the West um, about the sort of long history of Ukraine. Ukrainian and Russian are mutually intelligible. They share about 60%, I think, of, their, of the words in common. There's an, a long-running Russian feeling that Ukraine is actually really just a Western part of Russia. And there's a complex sort of historical narrative that goes with this. The Ukrainians are less uh, inclined to believe this. Uh, there's a lot of ethnic Russians in Ukraine, especially in the Donetsk Basin and in Luhansk in the eastern part of the country. Um, so there's a, there's a, a very pronounced uh, inclination among some Ukrainians to be close to Russia. That Ukrainian government under uh, Yushchenko, God, I can never remember anymore, was extremely corrupt. It's debatable whether the Ukrainian government under Zelensky is much less corrupt. Although they have at least made noises to about, you know, becoming less corrupt, which the, which the previous government I, I did not. But uh, Yanukovych, Yanukovych, ugh. anyway. This is the big, you know, the, the big narrative these days. There's a there's a there's a uh, international relations theorist named John Mearsheimer, a uh, relatively conservative guy, University of Chicago. He has come out and said that he really thinks that the war is the West's fault, that because we pushed EU expansion uh, and uh, NATO expansion to the borders of Russia, it made them. It then made Putin feel like he had no choice. If you're interested, his talk is on uh, YouTube. I, I really recommend watching it. Mearsheimer is a really bright guy. I really disagree with him in this case. But on the other hand, he has a tenured professorship at U of Chicago, and I don't. So uh, I'll just concede that right here. So NATO has been, since the end of the Cold War, an organization kind of looking for a purpose, right? Because its original purpose was to prevent the, the West from becoming, to prevent Western Europe from becoming neutral and to prevent communism from spreading. Well, uh, contrary to what some people seem to be convinced, uh, communism is dead as a dormouse. And, um, and so what is NATO here to do now uh, is, you know, NATO has been involved in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. NATO has been involved in Balkans. Uh, NATO is not really involved in this yet, but that's only because the Russians have not attacked a state that's a member of NATO, and once they do, that triggers Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, and then things get really dicey. Uh, and I, I mention this because, uh, so Sweden and Finland uh, applied to join NATO a couple of months ago, actually several months ago now. There's uh, Stoltenberg holding their application forms. The thing that's, right after this happened, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, the, the, the leader of Turkey, said, well, the Swedes have not been forthcoming enough in uh, stopping Kurdish dissidents, Kurdish terrorists from setting up in Sweden. Uh, so we're going to veto it because in order to join NATO, NATO is kind of like a, a frat house. Like all the, the, all the members have to vote you in. And, and one one person can, can, uh, can veto it. And it was unclear exactly what the deal with that was going to be. I mean, he seemed very adamant about it. The Finns had been negotiating with him. And then finally, as of about, I think, eight hours ago, Erdogan said that he would, uh, that he was okay and uh, the applications have been accepted. So we're now in a new situation, right, where a NATO state a major NATO state like 
soon to be Finland, is right up against the Russian border. The, the Russians have already been uh, engaging in cyber warfare against Lithuania. Lithuania, by the way, member of NATO. Uh, and here's an interesting thing, too. In 2009, I think it was, uh, NATO expanded their definition of attack to include cyber warfare. Um, so now it's theoretically possible, although it has now not happened at this point, that a cyber attack could trigger Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. And so what's the upshot here as far as NATO is concerned? Um, clearly, we're in a very dangerous situation right now. I mean, this, Europe hasn't seen this kind of warfare since 1945. There's an argument about whether the United States uh, made the, uh, the Euromaidan happen, made the Orange Revolution happen. I think that's probably not true, I, but we did cheerlead it pretty hard. <laughs> we were, like US politicians were going into Ukraine and we made it pretty clear which side of things we were on. And I can understand why. I mean, I, I, I think Vladimir Putin is, has some problems, but I can understand why from his perspective that doesn't, that's not a very good optic, right? Because, you, you know, part of your sort of whole idea here is that, is that Ukraine is really part of Russia, but at the very least, you know, he's wanting to integrate them into a kind of customs union uh, involving a number of, of states around the periphery of Russia. And I can understand why he feels like them being courted by the EU, them being maybe courted, depending on how you look at it, by NATO, is a, is a threatening type of situation, right? But uh, there's another way you can look at it, which is, uh, you know, from the U.S. perspective, if things don't go any further from this, right? It's one thing if there's like, you know, if he attacks Finland or the Balkans or whatever, like an Article 5 gets triggered, that's like a, that's a bad situation. But if it just stays in Ukraine, right, like it's costing the Russians money. It's costing them people. It's costing them their standing in the world. Even if the thing ended today, they'd still have lost a lot of money. They'd still, you know, they have this like $600 billion sort of war chest. So they're doing okay financially for now, and they sell oil. You know, it's like selling heroin. You, you got like, not to put too fine a point on it, but you're always gonna have a sort of, uh, it has a ready-made patron base, if you will. Um, so, but their standing in the, in the world has really declined, and it's gonna be very much harder. You know, the transaction costs get higher. So uh, from the US perspective, as long as things don't get to an Article 5 triggering, there really isn't a whole lot of downside to this. Now, it really depends on what you, as smart people reading the situation, think the likelihood of Article 5 happening is. And it's, but the, this, this is the sort of final thing I'm going to say. So um, Donald Trump uh, went to NATO and was very adamant that that the U.S. relationship to NATO had to change. And one of the things the U.S. is always kind of uh, perpetually upset about, and not without some good reason, is that part of the NATO agreement is that states will, have, will spend at least 2% of GDP on defense. The United States spends 3 point some percent. I mean, we spend more on defense than the next 15 largest states in the world. Um, but there's only three or four... European states. As a matter of fact, I think Greece actually spends a larger proportion of GDP on, on defense than we do. But there's only about three or four that actually hit that 2% uh, that threshold. And the Germans aren't one of them. Uh, Germans, and, and you know, I, I, I think it looks to a lot of people, uh, especially on the sort of Trump end of the political spectrum, like the Germans are free riding, which is not exactly true. I mean, they're still paying like, you know, $320 million dollars well, that's right. Yeah, the Germans are doing, it's not like they're hurting for cash. Um, and the, also the Germans are essentially running the European banking system. Um, so when President Trump went over there to, to sort of remonstrate with them about, about this, he was not, it wasn't, it wasn't a baseless thing to do. I mean, he really, you know, he has a point. Like, you know, Europe has to, Europe has spent 50 years since the Second World War, 70 years now. Uh, kind of free riding a little bit on, on our interest in 
preventing communism from spreading for a long time, and then our sort of interest in, in sort of keeping things uh, together. Now, $320 million does buy you a lot of influence, in fact. And it's, it's, in a way, it's relatively cheap. Like, once again, $320 million sounds like a lot of money uh, until you realize that it's like 0.003% of the U.S. defense budget. So it's not like, I mean, I can think of a lot better uses, or let me, I can, I can see thinking of a lot better uses for $320 million, but it's not like a big bite relative to the sort of the, what, the, what the pot of money involved is. But um, so the question going forward with NATO is going to be, is it going to be, can we balance this NATO structure that provides us influence in Europe, that's created a military structure that's integrated so that uh, we have large forces that work together. Our military's technology is interoperable. So we can create, we can work with the European s states and they use weapon systems that are interoperable with ours. Can we balance that against the alarm that is aroused among other people like the Russians, just as a for instance? Uh, and that's, you know, I think that's the long-term question. And I don't really have and answer. I mean, a lot of it is going to be is going to depend on how things play out in Ukraine, and when that's going to end is anybody's guess. There's no, I don't I strongly doubt it's going to end anytime soon, uh, and it's from a human perspective a really horrific tragedy and really one that, in a lot of respects, in a more sane organization wouldn't necessarily need to happen. I mean, really, like ultimately you would hope that given all the things that have gone down, human beings could actually just sort of talk about it. But if that was the case, a lot of things would be different about the way we've all organized ourselves. So, you know, NATO is this sort of, is this sort of, has been this very important thing, but it's now an organization kind of in search of a purpose. And it's, it's unclear, I think at this point, what that purpose is going to be. Just to say, by the way, the Europeans, the EU is developing its own defense forces. It's, it's much less, it's funded at a much less lower level or a much lower level than, than NATO is currently. But eventually, that's probably what's going to be, they probably will take that space, will flow into that space of NATO, which in one sense is great because it's cheaper for us, right? But on the other hand, what like, you know, what influence do we have with them once we're not, once we're not involved in this integrated structure that's left over from the Cold War? Anyway, thank you all so much for coming and uh, 